Club. This is a club for you to join, get 10 shows sent to you via email each and every month, or you can get these 10 shows available on five CDs. Right, Lisa? Right. We have some great shows as a part of the club that you'll never hear anywhere else other than as a part of a classic radio club. So being a member really opens some doors for you. And the reason I say that is because, of course, we play some of your favorites that you know and expect, but we also find some really unique shows, um, some hidden gems, some shows that are first in the series or that contain stars that you wouldn't expect to be in those shows. And those are the kind of things that we make sure to include in this classic radio club. Plus, I write very detailed liner notes about every show. So if you want to learn more about the Classic Radio Club, go to our website, classicradioclub.com. And you can experience it for the first month for only $1. We want everyone to try it. Go to ClassicRadioClub.com. Learn all about it. Get 10 shows sent to you each and every month, either via digital download or on five CDs in a collector case. All right. It's time now for The Whistler. This was a mystery series that premiered on CBS Radio in 1942. It was sponsored by Signal Oil. And the uh, the longest running guy to play the Whistler was Bill Foreman. He was this all knowing character who narrated a person's criminal acts and the criminal's fate would be ultimately undone because there was always a twist at the end of the Whistler. That was their kind of, you know, that was their selling point of this series. You were listening to it. And then at the very end. Unexpected. You never really know who who to expect, who right. did what, did who to who what. <laughs> yeah, it was a really great twist at the end. There was great supporting actors, Jack Webb, Gerald Moore, Elliot Lewis, William Conrad, nearly 700 episodes from this series, from 1942 all the way to 1955. And it was always consistently good. And it was a top, it was a top listen to show. I mean, people were always tuning in each and every week to The Whistler. We have an episode for you now. From July 2nd, 1945, it's called Deadly Innocent. Bill Foreman stars. Here's The Whistler. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Deadly Innocent. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Have you ever hated a man enough to kill him? No? Well, that's the kind of hate that grows with the years grows and grows into an all-consuming passion. That's the way it was with Lambert Dean. He has wanted to kill someone for 25 years. That's why he has come down to the offices of the Mammoth Construction Company at 9 o'clock at night. That's why he's chatted casually with the old night watchman who took him up in the elevator, chatting oh so casually. But he thought out every word in advance. The night watchman will remember them later, just a little later. There should be just a crack of light showing under the door of the president's office. Yes, there it is. And Lambert is going toward it. So you've never wanted to kill a man. Listen. You may get a few pointers. Hello, Joe. Huh? Oh? What are you doing here? Why, did I startle you, Joe? I'm so sorry. What do you mean by busting into my office? Can't you knock? Oh, sure, Joe. I'd never think of walking into the president's office without knocking during working hours. (laughs) I didn't think it'd matter tonight. Any time I'm here is working hours. Remember that if you want to hang on to your job. Now get out. Well, don't you want to know why I came down tonight? I do not. 
Any fool could take care of the bookkeeping department in the daytime. If you have to work nice to keep up with simple routine, that's your lookout. Oh, I don't have to work on them. They're all fixed up, just the way I want them. I, uh, <coughs> I came here to tell you about them, Joe. Well, oh, you can keep it. The books will wait till tomorrow. Better you? listen now, if you want to hear it at all. How many times have I got to tell you to get... What do you mean, better listen? Tomorrow will be too late. You'd better listen, Joe. Yeah, maybe I had. What are you up to? Anything wrong with the books? <laughs> You're a smart guy, Joe. You always were. Even back when you were a kid in knickers. Oh, for the love of Pete, if you're going to start ricking up past history... And... The sooner you let me talk, the sooner you'll get it over with. Well, if you've got anything to say, say it. My time's valuable. Is it? <laughs> yes, you were smart, making up to me when we were kids. You were my pal. You looked after me. Never let anybody bully me. Uh, your dad had dough. Mine didn't. Uh-huh. It was worth having you hung around my neck if it got me the kind of life I wanted. And it did, didn't it? Pretty soon you just about moved in on us. When I went to college, Dad sent you too. Good, kind Joe Carson, who always looked after poor little me. All right, all right, so you finally tumbled to it. What of it? When Dad got wiped out and we had to leave school and hunt work, you didn't drop me. <laughs> I'm no fool. You still belonged on the right side of the tracks. You knew the folks that counted. Sure, Joe, sure, you were smart. I knew the men with the jobs to give. I found out about old Jennings needing a bookkeeper down here at Mammoth. Only when I got around to applying, they already had a new bookkeeper. You. Well, if you were dope enough to tell me about it, you deserved what you got. Maybe I wouldn't have seen the future in a piddling little bookkeeping job if you hadn't run off of the mouth about that, too. I'm going to be the bright young man who catches Jennings' eye, Joe. I'm going to marry Betsy Jennings. Someday I'll own Mammoth, lock, stock, and barrel. You haven't got Mammoth yet, smart guy. No, just all the rest. Give me time. Old man Jennings is on his last legs, and you know it. Now get out. You're fired. Haven't you forgotten the books, Joe? I'll check them by myself. Now out. No. Get out, or I'll... No, you. I'm not going. You are. What? This is the end of the line for you, Joe. Tomorrow, I'll move into your office. Pretty soon, I'll move into your house with Betty. Before long, I'll own Mammoth. <laughs> You're crazy. Like a fox. I'm going to kill you, Joe. Signal goes as far as before the war. Yes, Signal gasoline still goes as far as before the war. But how can it, I hear you asking? How can it when certain gasoline ingredients are reserved for war? Well, that's what I want to tell you. You see, it's true, certain of the more volatile ingredients, such as isopentane, have been reserved for war. That's why Signal Oil Company is frank to admit no gasoline today can promise you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war signal gasoline, and which you'll be enjoying again in even further improved signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's another story. For today's signal formula contains not only all the high-energy components that gave pre-war signal its superior mileage, but in addition, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have been added. That's why it's a fact. The famous signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. That's why it's just as true today as it was before the war. You do go farther with signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. They say even the humblest worm will turn if you step on him hard enough. You didn't think of that, did you, Joe Carson, when you used your pal for a stepladder, stole his job, his girl, the life he planned. You weren't quite smart enough. You're alone in your office now with the night pressing around you, alone with the turned worm. He's going to kill you, Joe. Sit down, Joe. Drop that gun, you crazy fool. Sit down. That's better. <laughs> Wouldn't like you to be uncomfortable. You've got a nice, easy chair to die in, Joe. The president's chair. Now, Lamb. Lamb, listen. Let's talk this thing over. Mm. We're both businessmen. Maybe we can make a deal. Yeah. When old man Jennings kicks off, there'll be plenty for both of us. Now, come on, put down that gun. If we put down this... this gun? Why, Joe, I like it. Huh? Feels good in the hand. A sweet gun, Joe. 
it. The day you bought it, you signed your death warrant. You know that? Would you like to know about it? That's right, Lambert. Tell Joe about it. Don't let him die without knowing how smart you've been for a change. Remind him of the day Mr. Jennings retired from the business. The day Joe put that gun in his desk drawer and bragged that the payroll would be safe. Joe's own gun in Joe's own desk with Mr. Jennings for a witness. Convenient, wasn't it? But don't stop there. Tell him your whole plan. Tell him about that day two months ago when you started on your careful, deadly trail. <coughs> Hello, Mr. Dean. Have a good lunch? Uh, no, not very, I'm afraid. Nothing seems to agree with me these days. Uh, you may go to your own lunch now, Miss Neal. Okay. If you ask me, your stomach would be a lot better off without all those pills you keep stuffing down your neck. I was not aware that I'd asked you, Miss Neal. No, yeah, it's your stomach. Bye. Back soon. Uh, Miss Neal, hmm? have you seen my tablets? They don't seem to be in my pocket. I'm sure I had them this morning. I remember taking a couple when I got to the office. Oh, well, sure I've seen them. You left them on the water cooler. Uh, Big boy Carson raised Kane about it when he went out to eat. Say, hey, what's he got against you, anyhow? Against me? Oh, you must be mistaken, Miss Neal. Joe was my friend. We were boyhood friends. Then why is he always picking on you and yelling at you? Looks to me like he wants to run you out of here. Only he doesn't dare as long as the old man's alive. Miss Neal, I cannot allow you to speak like that about my friend. Now that Mr. Carson is in sole charge of the business, he's naturally under a strain. We, we must all make allowances. Oh, yeah. Here. I hid your pills under the stuff on your desk. Uh -huh. How many do you want? Two? Put out your hand. Uh, thank you. Now you sit still. I'll bring you some water. Uh, that's very... One moment. Hmm? These aren't my tablets. Why, sure they are. They're right out of your bottle. That little brown bottle you're always hauling out. See? Uh, that's my bottle, but the tablets... Uh, mine were white, too, but considerably smaller. I showed you one yesterday. Don't you remember? Remember one tablet from another? Oh, honest, Mr. Dean... Well, gee, you're right. Yours had some kind of trade name stamped on them. These are perfectly plain. Uh, that's, that's strange, isn't it? Somebody's playing a dirty trick on you. Probably thought it'd be a good joke to give you something that'd really upset your tummy. Why, I can't believe it. Say, there's Mr. Carson. What? Joe? That's it, I'll bet you anything. It'd be just like him. Oh, now, Miss Neal, please. <sighs> We have no proof that Mr. Carson had anything to do with this. He saw the bottle, didn't he? He yelled about it, and he hates you. You know he does. Uh, these tablets may be perfectly harmless. Harmless? Oh, golly. You don't suppose Mr. Carson would... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let your imagination run away with you. But, Mr. Dean, he obviously wants to get now, rid please, of you. please, please, Miss Neal. I forbid you to speak of this to anyone. I'm going to destroy these tablets at once, and uh, we'll forget all about it. Well, it's your funeral. But if it was me, I'd have those pills analyzed. That's right, Lambert. That was step one along the trail leading to Joe's untimely death. But don't stop there. Before you pull the trigger, tell him the whole story. Tell him about step two. Hey, look out! Oh, oh, I... Look where you're going, can't you? Oh, yeah. Did you just see that? You all right, mister? Uh, yes, I I think I'm... It didn't hit me. Boy, you got luck to burn. If you hadn't jumped like a grasshopper, that car would have made mincemeat out of you. Uh, I was walking along close to the pavement. Uh, somebody shoved me hard. Then I was out in the street in that car. Well, what do you know? Hey, I guess it could happen easy enough with all these crowds on the sidewalk. Yes, easy enough. Uh, you didn't happen to notice who was behind me. <laughs> In all that gang? Look, mister, there were dozens of people. Businessmen and ladies shopping and... Well, I thought you might have seen one special person. He'd, he'd be a big man, a gray hat and top coat. You'd notice him. Wait a minute. You mean that shove wasn't no accident? This guy was out to get you? Uh, I'd rather not say any more. <laughs> well, that's the way it was. Let me think. Let me think here. Seems to me I do remember a gray hat. A big man, around 45, with a red face. Yeah. Yeah, he'd have to be big to stand out in the crowd, wouldn't he? Red face. Sure, sure, I remember now. Perhaps you saw the face towering over me? Towering over you? Yes. Oh, he must have been for me to pick him out special. 
Hey, that puts the fella right smack behind you.